Gentlemen, what is going on today? My name is Ryan Mickler, and I am the host and the founder of the Order of Man Movement and Podcast. I want to welcome you here and welcome you back. We continue to grow this thing, which is very, very important. Uh, and I'm going to talk with you a little bit about why I believe this mission is so important uh, as I talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, my family, and of course, the uh, the power that comes not just within the dynamics of, of the walls of our home, but within society as a whole. Guys, if you're new to the movement, to the podcast, this is a resource which is dedicated to giving you the tools, conversations, resources, guidance, direction, focus, clarity, processes, all that you need to be a more capable father, husband, business owner, leader in your community, and a man in general. So I'm going to get to that in just a minute uh, as far as creating a powerful family culture and why this is so important. We're going to talk about what culture means. Uh, we're going to talk about how, again, to create something that's powerful within the walls of your home, which obviously will impact society. Uh, and then we're going to get into four, a four-step process. We'll call it that, a four-step process for beginning to create your own family dynamic. Uh, this may be for young men with new families, or maybe you've got kids that are uh, in their, their high school years or middle school years, or maybe they're leaving or you're empty nesters. I th still think what we're going to be sharing with you today is going to be very, very valuable for you. And again, collectively society as a whole, uh, before I get into that, I just want to mention, we've got a lot of new merchandise and products in our store, and it's a great way to support what we're doing here. And of course, look good in the process. Uh, if you would check it out, we've got hats, we've got shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got our new windbreakers that we just got in last week. We've got this one, a green one, and then a black with camo. Uh, so we've got some new cool stuff over there. Check it out, store.orderofman.com, store.orderofman.com. Again, a great way to support what we're doing here. Look good in the process. They're clothes you need anyways. You might as well uh, support if you believe in what we're doing, and that's a great way to do it. All right, guys, let's get into this. So, you know, I wanted to talk with you first about what I think generally is happening in society, not just to and about the family, but I think I was going to say that, that, that it is intentional and it, and it is intentional. And some of it, I don't know is entirely intentional, but at a minimum, the family unit is being rooted away uh, from society. And, and I think there's a lot of intentional reasons about that. I think there's a lot of people who would be in control who would love nothing more than to be everybody's mother and father and, and completely demolish and undermine and diminish the importance and the role of biological fathers and mothers in the home. Uh, I think that's very clear. I think it's very deliberate. I think it's very intentional. And I also think that there's a lot about society that just unintentionally roots it away uh, and, and, and rots or attempts to rot the value and the perception of what the family brings to children, to a husband, to a wife, and then to society as a whole. You know, you look at the family court system, for example, and how that is stacked against men. I saw a statistic the other day that said there are more single 30-year-olds than there are married 30-year-olds. And I know inevitably when I talk about that, men will say, well, there's no real reason for men to get in, uh, married anymore. And, and I think this comes from the ultimate play to diminish and demean and look down upon men who would love nothing more than to lead their families with honor and strength and courage and raise righteous children and lead their wives to a place they could not have imagined going on their own. So we're, we're up against a, a very tall order here. And I believe that the family unit is fundamental to a thriving society. This is where children, our future generations learn about hard work and, and virtue and being honest and the lessons that come with rolling around with their dad or working in the shop or sweeping floors and having chores and the responsibility of um, managing a home and everything else that goes into you being a dad, you raising kids, you leading your wife, et cetera, et cetera. It's very, very important. And yet all of these units, we'll call them for, for the sake of argument, are being undermined and rooted away the family unit you look at church even over the past six to eight months i mean this the church is a place where regardless of what denomination or anything like that church is a place where people learn the the power of the individual uh they learn about responsibility they learn about virtuous living and sacrifice and honor and commitment there's other institutions and organizations that traditionally provided this as well one i think of is boy scouts and i've been very vocal about 
the Boy Scouts and how they've lost their way and they've tried to appease the doctrine of popular culture rather than live by and live according to their standards that are set forth in the charter. And it's a real shame and a travesty to the young men who unfortunately don't have a great family dynamic or potentially don't have a father at home. So guys, we need to do better. If you're a father, you need to do better, just like I do. I'm not pointing fingers at you. Uh, if, if you're not a biological father, there's opportunities for you to act as a father, for to be fatherly or to act as a father figure. That could be coaching. That could be mentoring, a big brothers, big sisters program. There's all sorts of ways that you can do this, but it's very, very important that what we do is the patriarch. And I know that becomes a swear word in, in modern times, and it's not at all. I have a completely different definition of it. In fact, I think it's much needed and a valuable contribution to society. So as a patriarch, it's your job to ensure that there's a culture set forth in your family that cannot be rooted away, that cannot be undermined, that cannot be diminished by uh, the government, by the school system, uh, by the doctrine of popular culture. I mean, I even think about young children going to college and losing their way because they've been indoctrinated to believe something that uh, should have been unshakable as, as a child because they learned these things over 18 years of being involved with a mother and a father in the home. This is why it's so important that you create a culture and you're deliberate about it. You're intentional about it because if you're not deliberate, intentional about it, some of it might happen and some of it may wear off, but you're going to be less effective. And I don't know about you, but as a father or whatever role that I show up in, I want to be as effective as possible. And sometimes because I'm a human being, <laughs> I mess up. I screw up. I don't do what I need to be doing. Uh, I lose my patience. I lose my, cult, my cool. I potentially, you know, occasionally yell at my children and I don't want to do that. And there's things that I do and I go wrong. And I've realized that if I'm more intentional about the way that I show up as the patriarch of my home, the husband, the father, the man of the house, then I will be more effective in accomplishing what I want to accomplish, which is to partner with my wife, walk hand in hand with her towards our goals and our ambitions that we have for our lives and to raise self-sufficient contributing members of society, children who don't, I, sh I shouldn't say children, adults who don't need me or their mother in their lives anymore. We, they want us in their lives, but don't need us in their lives. That's the kind of man that I want to be. That's the kind of patriarch I want to be. And the intentionality I'm going to give you today is going to help you do just that. So this is a four-step formula for creating and fostering a much-needed culture to, in a way, I don't want to say shield, but protect against the, the, the degenerate society that has infected most of the world, it seems like, at this point. I want to inoculate my children against that. I, want to, I, I don't want to protect them. I don't want to shield them from it. But I want this home to be a place where they know that what they learn is true and right and good and will serve them and other people well. That's why the culture is so important. And they're not going to get it anywhere else. They're not. They're not going to get it in the schools. They're not going to get it when they get to college. They're not going to get it from their friends because odds are their friends aren't getting the culture they need. And everything else that they're going to be exposed to, so certainly not on social media or the media in general or movies or music or any of that, everything else they're exposed to is typically at direct odds with the culture that I'm sure the overwhelming majority of you as men are trying to create in your family. So let's talk about this four-step formula. Number one is you have to identify what the culture is. I already told you you need to be intentional. If you're just doing this kind of haphazardly and you're not thinking much about it, you're probably going to get some things right. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> you're not going to screw everything up. You're going to screw a lot up, just like I do, just because that's what we do. Uh, but if you're not intentional about it, you're going to screw up more things than, than you would otherwise if you were intentional about it. So I think this is the very first and I was going to say the most important. It's not the most important they're all important, equally important. You need to do all of these steps, not just one. But it is very crucial that you identify what type of culture that you want to create. What do you tolerate? What do you stand for? What don't you stand for? What values do you have as a family? It starts with you as the father. And then it's communicated to your wife. And then it's communicated and articulated to your children. 
And by the way, I think it's very important that we get them involved in the process. I'm going to turn my camera here for just a quick minute. So right there on the wall, right there is, if you're not watching this and you're just listening, obviously you can't see it, but uh, you can go to YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're interested. But right there is a um, code of conduct that my two oldest boys and I created and we did it together. It wasn't something that I, uh, that I just thought of and documented and didn't get them involved in the process. No, I asked them, what do you value? What's important? How do we act in, in the heat of the moment? And when things get scary or you feel emotional or you feel upset or whatever it may be, how are you going to behave? How are you going to respond to people? And so we documented that. We wrote it all down. And as we wrote it down, I got them involved in the process and I directed and navigated it. And then, so we've got it all written down there. And then I just went ahead and I, I framed it. And I've got one and my two oldest boys have one in their room as well. Okay, so you have to identify it. What, what is it that you value? Do you value hard work? Do you value honesty, integrity, cleaning up after yourself? Do you value being kind towards one another, a, a service mentality that, that you're an individual and you're more important than anybody else in the, in the household or that this is a collective? And yes, you are important as an individual, but not any more important than anybody else. How are we going to behave in certain circumstances? And when things get hard and difficult, do we quit or do we drive forward? Guys, you've got to document the stuff. You've got to write it down. You've got to identify it. I would also have you consider that maybe you ought to think about some traditions that you can incorporate. I mean, isn't that what culture is? Culture, loosely defined, and I'm paraphrasing here, would be a, a collective body of humans. So in this case, your, your family but it could be geographical or your neighborhood or your church or whatever. But in this case, obviously your family. So it's a collection of human beings who all are working towards the same objective, believe very much the same way, celebrate, honor, uh, encourage, foster each other. Uh, and then of course have certain traditions in place to honor each other and to honor the commitments and to honor the things that you as a family unit value. So if you don't have traditions, from very serious traditions, I'll give you an example, rites of passages for my children. When they, get to turn, when they turn eight years old, they have a rite of passage every two years until they're 18. Those are very serious traditions. Now, granted, we have fun and we enjoy the process, but there's also a lot of struggle and there's a lot of, a lot of hardship in there as well. And there's things that they earn uh, that, that, that they can use in their life and, and, and have and as a remembrance of what they completed. That's a tradition. And it might be, you know, silly traditions, things like, hey, we're just going to get together and we, we carve pumpkins or Tuesday night is taco night. And that's just what we do. Every Tuesday night is taco night. And that's your tradition. Those are silly. Some are, are less serious, of course, and some are more serious. And you've got to have a broad range of them. You've got to have them all because what I want my children to do and what I assume you want your children to do is when they get out into the real world and it's all real, but you understand what I mean when they get out into the real world and they're faced with a job and, and bills and their own families and the hardship that comes with being a human being, that what they can do is they can look back fondly on the experiences that you and your wife created and they can draw upon the lessons, the foundational principles, the values, and the traditions that you implemented over nearly two decades of raising them and they can begin to incorporate that into their life or at a minimum use that as a, as a compass, as a North Star to get them through the hardship that they will inevitably face. What we're doing now as we create a family, uh, a family culture is we're creating the foundational bedrock in which they will build their lives. The, the adage is uh, the wise man builds his house upon the stone, right? And the, the foolish man builds his house upon the sand. A family culture is the stone. It's the bedrock that your children and your wife and you will use to get yourself through the difficult, inevitable hardships that we are going to face throughout life. And if you don't do this for them by identifying and by getting them involved in the process, they will build their foundation of life on sand, on loose soil, on, as I've said in the past, the doctrine of popular culture, which is goes whichever, which way people are feeling at the time and it's fleeting and it has no, no stable value to it. Identify what you value, 
identify what you stand for, identify. And by the way, it's not everything, all right? When you're, when you're creating your culture, you don't need to do every, we're going to address every little situation that would possibly come up. What you ought to do is you ought to write this stuff down as a family unit. So you do this on a Monday evening or a Sunday night or whatever, whenever works for you. And you start listing out what are, what are important uh, lessons? What are, what are the things that we value? What do we enjoy doing together as a family? Are we a culture of, of excellence? Are we a culture of uh, physical activity? Are we a culture of video games or something worse? Like, what is it that you guys stand behind? And so you document, you write all this stuff down. And what you're going to start to find is you're going to start to find different values and experiences, traditions that all kind of lump together into certain categories. And those are the categories that you want to address. Because if you dress it all, it becomes less relevant. You dress the most significant and important things and then go from there. And again, the traditions as well. So step number one is identify. Step number two is uh, how are you going to communicate this? How are you going to communicate this culture? Because it's not enough just to have a culture. Like at times it does need to be communicated, right? So I can draw upon, I'm going to turn my camera again here, just so you can see. I've got my code of conduct right there. When myself, because I uphold myself to this code of conduct, but when myself or my children fall out of line with that code of conduct, now it's very easy for me to go back because we did this and we did this together. So we can go back and say, hey, listen, you know, here's how you behaved or here's what you did. And this wasn't in line with the code of conduct that you and I created. So what do we need to do to get back on track? And now I have documentation that I didn't create. We created it together. They adhered to it. They actually signed it. Literally their signatures are on that because they signed it and they helped create it. And now we can draw back on it. We can look at it and we can say, okay, well, that was my behavior and it wasn't in alignment with our code of conduct. So this is what the expectation is. This is what the standard is. And, uh, and you get yourselves back on track because it's easy for all of us to deviate. But without identifying it and without having the ability or the methods for communicating this type of information, again, you're just kind of flying by the seat of your pants excuse me, and hoping things work out. So what I would suggest is that you have a, a weekly family meeting. Now, this, some of this stuff should obviously take place uh, every single day. Every single day. Now for us, what works best is having these types of conversations at the dinner table. And so we'll go around and we'll ask, what was the best part of your day? What are you grateful for? What do you want to accomplish? What's tomorrow look like? How are your goals happening? Like we talk about these things over dinner. It's a very easy way to do it. We're all enjoying and laughing and eating and having a good time. And yet we use it as an opportunity to get very serious about what we're wanting to accomplish as a family and what our children want, will want to accomplish when they are no longer uh, in this house. So how are you going to communicate it? Again, I'd recommend uh, a weekly meeting, dedicated, no, no phones. Like we all know what time we do it. We do it. We're consistent about it. It happens. And then having... Uh, daily checkpoints, different things that are built into your day. And I, look, I know it's hard. You know, there's so much going on school and potentially sports, maybe not so much now with, with uh, this, this uh, COVID thing. Um, but you know, when, when things begin to pick back up and normalize and stabilize and they will, uh, you're going to have things, they're going to have things. They're going to be at school and sports and dance and baseball and all this other stuff. Uh, so it becomes increasingly difficult, but if, if you want to lead your family well and you want to create this culture, this is exactly what you'll do. All right, that's step number two is communication method. Step number three is implementation. I mean, really, you just got to implement it, right? And when things don't go the way that they should be going or the way that you guys have agreed collectively to, to the, the culture is you need to get back on track and you need to squash it. And look, guys, as parents, it doesn't make it easier as a parent when things go wrong that you automatically just address it and deal with it. Because sometimes, especially in the short term, it's easier to let things slide. Oh, you know, he didn't do his chore and so like he can do it tomorrow or he didn't get his schoolwork done and so we'll play catch up another time. No, like if it's in your culture that we are responsible, that we do our chores, that we take care of the house, that we're grateful for what we have and we treat our things with respect. I mean, I've, I've gotten my children out of bed to do a chore. And at times my wife and I have disagreed on that, but I've said, look, the standard and the expectation is that you have responsibility and it doesn't go away because you're tired. So if uh, I tell my son, for example, to do the dishes after dinner, and then he somehow sneaks by and doesn't get it done. And then it's bedtime and I see he got in bed and I go downstairs and I notice the dishes aren't done. I go in there and say, Hey bud, 
you got to go downstairs and do the dishes. And yeah, of course, he's upset. And I just want to sleep. I'm tired. Hey, then do it the first time you're asked. But there needs to be a consequence to it. Because if there's no consequence, if you're not enforcing the culture, and I'm not saying be the taskmaster, the slave driver, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying you are the, uh, the, the, the standard by which everything else is measured. And you need to make sure that the, those standards that the culture you've created together and collectively is adhered to. Otherwise, is it really a culture at all? No, of course not. Everybody's doing their own thing. They're all going in their own direction. There's no real guidance or clarity or focus on what you should be doing. And of course, you're not producing the results that you want. So communicate this stuff, guys. Communicate always, constantly, frequently. And that's why uh, I talked about those communication methods. But then this will also help you with ensuring that everything is implemented and then talking with them about how we behave and why we do it. That's another important thing. A lot of parents will say, you just do it just because I said so. And I get it because you're tired. And you don't want to continue to have the same conversations over and over again about doing your chores or doing your homework or, you know, whatever it is you do. And yet that's a lazy way to address it. And I'm not pointing fingers. I do this too. Just do it because I said so, because that's what we do. That's not really serving them, right? So we need to explain and communicate and articulate why this is what we do. So if my children, for example, don't want to do the dishes, I'm like, cool, don't do the dishes, but you don't get to use the dishes when it's dinner time. Because if you want to use the dishes, then there's some responsibility that comes with that. And that means you have to do the dishes. If you don't want to make the bed, okay, we'll sleep on the floor. Well, I, I don't want to sleep on the floor. I don't want to sleep on the bed. Then make the bed because that's the responsibility of, of having the thing. So we're teaching lessons as we're communicating this culture as well. And, and guys, the last step is just to really reinforce it. And I kind of touched on this a little bit too. So again, the, the, the four steps, I'm going to get into the, the reinforcement section here in a second. But the four steps are number one, identify what your culture is. You got to talk about it, guys. If you don't talk about it, you don't address it, you don't think about it, uh, it's not going to happen. And it's certainly not going to be effective as it could be had you uh, communicated it. Number two is communicate those methods frequently, often, as often as you possibly can. Communicate those, uh, those methods or those uh, traditions and values and things that you want to adhere to. Communicate those. Find methods for doing that. Number three is implementation. Also, as a father, your job is to ensure that you're creating opportunities for your children and your wife to exercise the culture and the thoughts and the, and the beliefs and the actions that you guys have agreed upon doing. And that's not always convenient, right? It's not always easy. It's not always convenient. It's certainly a challenge when life is so busy and you have work and you have other obligations and, and priorities. But you as a father need to create opportunities for your children to struggle, for them to do the right thing. Uh, just this morning, in fact, uh, I, I told my two oldest boys, we got some new, I talked about the store, the order of man store earlier. We got some new merchandise in and I said, boys, I need you to, uh, check in this inventory. We got two, two new items. I think we got a, a new shirt and, uh, some hoodies. And I said, I need you to document the inventory, check it all in, make sure it's right. Punch it in the computer. They know how to do this because we've had these conversations and they put up a little stink. I'm like, Hey, this is what I require. Right, this is what the store requires. You want to manage the store? You want to make money? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Then this is what you have to do. And so they did it reluctantly at first, but they got doing it. And uh, I could have done it. I would have done it faster. <laughs> I would have done it more effectively because they actually did mess up on, on one of them and we had to correct it. If I would have done it, it would have been done faster, more effectively, and, and, and just better. But that's not the goal for me as a father. <laughs> the goal for me as a father is to create opportunities where they can do what they're supposed to be doing. And if I go back and I see that it's done incorrectly, well, here in the Mickler household, we have a culture of excellence, which means you don't shortcut. You don't take the easy way just because it's more convenient. You do it correctly. You do it right. You do it excellent. So I went down there and I saw that it wasn't done as, as, as correctly as it could have been. And I called them both in and they were doing their own stuff at that point. And they were again, frustrated. I said, no, remember we have a culture of excellence and this is an opportunity for you to be excellent. So me as a father creates those opportunities, even though, yeah, I sacrifice my time and attention and resources. My job isn't as a father to do everything for them. It's to create opportunities for them to figure some things out. So when it comes to implementate, Im implementing these processes, you have to create the opportunities. And then guys, again, the last step is to reinforce them. Right? reinforce them. And, and I'm not just talking about negatively, by the way, because you could read into that and think, okay, well, if things aren't going right, then it's your job to be, you know, the bearer of bad news and, and to toe the line and, and get them all in, in step. And yes, certainly you're going to have to do that at times. 
but also reinforcement means positive reinforcement. So when you see your son or daughter doing something that is in accordance and adherence to the culture you're trying to create, then you honor that. And, and by the way, I'm not saying reward that, okay? Because I think what we could get into is making them believe or leading them to believe that every time they do something that they just should do, that they're entitled to some prize or, or gift. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What, what you're trying to do here is to reinforce the behavior. So if you see that your son does something, maybe he cleans his room and you go in there and you're like, wow, this actually looks really good. <laughs> like he's, he's got all the little corners, put all the clothes away. He did things that I asked him, didn't ask him to do. Like he actually did a really good job on this. Then you reinforce that behavior by saying, Hey, you know what, son? I went and checked your room after you cleaned it. And I got to say, man, it looked really good. Your bed's tightly and, and nicely made. You vacuum the floor. You put your clothes away. Uh, you picked up the trash that was lying around, and you did an excellent job. And I, I'm proud of you. I honor you for doing that. Good job. We don't need to make it a bigger deal than it is, but he's going to be more enticed, or your daughter will be more enticed to continue that behavior if they know that they're going to get positive reinforcement from you. So when I talk about the fourth step to reinforce, I'm talking about not only the, the negative, the disciplinary, because I think that's easy for us as men to fall into, not even fall into, just do, it is required. So I'm not just talking about the discipline and making sure that people are doing things right and getting after them when they're not. I'm talking about the positive reinforcement that comes along with doing things well. And when they thrive and succeed, then you honor that. I'll give you another example. My oldest son, he has lost, I want to say he's lost about 5% body fat and 16 pounds over the past 30 to 40 days. And the kid is on a terror right now. I mean, he's, he's exercising one, at least maybe two times a day. Uh, he's eating right. He's making good decisions when there's sweets and treats. He doesn't partake of those things. These, these are his decisions he made on his own. And every day I honor and commend him for the work that he's doing. Not unnecessarily, I don't go overboard. I don't get him a bunch of gifts and shower him with all these lavish praises. I just say, you know what? I'm proud of you. You're doing a really good job. And you know what? You're also inspiring me to do a better job. And you can see when I say that, he gets a little twinkle in the eye. He puts his shoulders back and his chest up a little bit higher. And then he has just a little bit more fuel, not a lot, but just a little bit more fuel to continue to do what we encourage him to do. And he's better for it. And he feels proud about it. And he's accomplishing. And he's becoming the type of young man that I've always hoped he would become because we're doing some things right. Not everything, certainly <laughs> myself more, you know, than, than my wife, but I, I don't get it all right. Not even close, but being very intentional and deliberate about the culture that we're trying to create has been valuable for me. It's been valuable certainly for my wife and my children. And it's something that I plan on doubling down on because I realize the importance of culture in a world that has lost all sense of culture and meaning and purpose and tradition and values and collective ambitions. The world is losing that. Some of that is intentional by design and some of it is not. But regardless, the world is losing it. And we as fathers and husbands have the opportunity to create a stable bedrock for our families to thrive and to grow well beyond them being under our household and well beyond our time on this planet. But it starts with you. It starts with understanding the, the power and the importance of a culture. And it starts with a four-step process of one, identifying what your culture is together and collectively. Two, the communication methods for ensuring that you guys continue to stay on track with the culture. Three is the implementation of that culture and creating opportunities for your children to step into it. And four, to reinforce, to discipline when necessary and to positively encourage and reinforce when appropriate. All right, guys, I hope it helps. Leave me some messages, uh, send me an email, whatever, whatever it may be, uh, and let me know what, uh, what you're doing in your family dynamic, how, how you're improving your culture. And let's continue to share. Let's continue to grow. Support the Order Man movement by heading to the store. That's a small, seemingly insignificant way to do it, but it is appreciated. And it gives me an opportunity to uh, give my children responsibility, which is part of our family culture, because they're running the store. And every package that you get will be received by my oldest or uh, my second son. Uh, but also share this, all right? If you if you like this message or any other message that we've shared, any of the podcasts, the interviews that we've done, then just share it. Share it with somebody who needs to hear it. Take a screenshot of you listening to the podcast, post it up on Instagram or Facebook, wherever you're on social media. 
Twitter. I'm very active over there, all at Ryan Mickler. You can find me, and uh, let's continue the conversations. All right, guys, I will be back uh, next week. I'm going to be hunting next week. I'm excited about that, uh, but I've got some pre-recorded conversations for you because I just want to keep the momentum, if I can say that, and the, uh, the ball rolling. All right, guys, we'll be back next week. Until then, go out there, take action, become the man you are meant to be.